Welcome to the Big Picture Film Club. I'm Presh Williams. As part of our retrospective look at the 2006 classic Dream Girls, it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to be joined by the director, Bill Condon. Bill, how are you doing? I'm doing well, and it's very nice to meet you, and thank you for choosing this movie to be to be part of your series. Um, I, I suppose the first question I had it was kind of, what was your first... Um, how did you first sort of discover or get the opportunity rather to sort of take dream girls from like Tom Irons, um like theater production and then yeah. sort of have the opportunity to adapt it to the big screen? What was those, com what were those conversations like? So it was, um, I was at a party and um, chatting with a friend of mine, Larry Mark, who's a producer. Um, and it was right after Chicago had opened. And he said, well, if you had your druthers, what would be your the next musical you'd, you'd want to do? And I, it, it didn't take me a second. It was like Dream Girls, Dream Girls. That's the great unmade musical from that period. So he was friends with David Geffen. So David, at that moment, um, it was, you know, uh, David and Jeff Katzenberg and Steven Spielberg had joined to, together to make DreamWorks. But it was sort of toward the end of their initial incarnation, you know, so, and Spielberg, mm. uh, Katzenberg had sort of stepped back and if not left by then, and Spielberg was busy with a couple of movies. So David was kind of running DreamWorks at that time. He was also um, the person with all the rights to the original show, right? Yeah. Um, so it was this rare, like very old school Hollywood situation where one man controlled everything, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. So I went to uh, talk to him with Larry and he was very upfront. He said that he felt this tremendous responsibility to Michael Bennett, who had created the show, who, uh, you know, had, had passed away um, uh, because the chorus line movie, in his opinion, and I think shared by many others, had been a, a, a you know, kind of a, a you know, a mess and it had actually hurt um the reputation of the show for a while you know and he was that's why there had been times when dream girls had almost been made i think there was a whitney houston version of it oh, wow. that had been happening around 10 years earlier and david had always sort of pulled the plug you know because he wasn't going to do it unless he felt confident that it was going to be done right um i sort of laid out um what my approach would be uh we were on the same page you know it was sort of they they'd been in the show um you wonder if it was po possibly for legal reasons but they'd been a little coy about the connection of the dreams to the supreme something that was yeah. extremely <laughs> obvious to, to anybody who <laughs> watched it you know and my yeah. feeling was you know film is a more realistic medium and to really kind of set it in its time set it in a place mm -hmm. and just give it that that kind of that extra weight you know and and he agreed with that um so we i was off i i and just back to the kind of one man show thing there i um gave him a script i said i was done he had he had a messenger come to my house uh the day after new year's and um he read it that night he called and he said it made him cry and i am not kidding within <laughs> a week we we're opening offices and we were shooting by the end, end of that year because nice. it was again one guy saying yes you know <laughs> um I, I suppose in that sort of connection to motown the supremes I, I, yeah. I guess was there any thought in in those conversations whether all right why don't we just go dive in and do actually a, a motown uh sort of biopic in in a way uh rather than dream girls or did right. dream girls specifically give you an artistic license to sort of broaden out story arcs storylines and in, 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 in a way that kind of something more you know particular to motown or the supremes wouldn't have allowed you yeah i think um you know in making the movie I felt that we had to, I was very aware of Motown, the Supremes, the reality of that, mm -hmm. and 
Dream Girls. Dream Girls by then was its own thing. You know, I'm not saying right. it was as big as Motown, but the the this piece of theater mattered to a huge number of people, and mm -hmm. specifically, you know. Um, Recently, I was asked again, how, what was it, you know, uh, let's get to the basic question, being a white director making this movie, you know, um, and, and you know, um, I don't think it would happen today, but that was a question that was asked when we were making that film or when we were promoting the movie then. So even, even you know, and the, the, the one thing I did say was that it had always been there and no one wanted to do it, you know. Um, mm. I talked to Spike Lee. He didn't want to do it. So it was, <laughs> it was, it was partly that, but partly, and, and this will, I realized later there's something glib about this, um, which I didn't mean it to be. And so I'll, I'll refine it after I say it. But my answer then was how I truly felt, which was that it was, um, it was a musical based, you know, created by, um, a group of white gay men with one black gay man, Michael Peters, who was the co-choreographer, you know, who was, had been Michael Jackson's choreographer. But of, And the, my point being that it is as much gay art, you know, as, yeah. is so, and, 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 and it felt, so I felt like I was, I was representing that aspect of it, you know, yeah, yeah, that yeah. place where it, you know, it veers, you know, where, you know, let's face it, that title number, I can still wander into a gay bar tonight, and, and <laughs> you know, and if it's the right, I was in Chicago the other day and they were playing it, you know. So, I mean, there's there's the part that's glib about that is that you know I think in the time since then, namely the forty plus years since that show was was uh, created, it's it's um, did they have the right? Did that group of gay white men have the right to tell that story? You know, and I think that's a legitimate. Yeah question you know um <clears throat> it's a long way of answering what you're what you're asking but i think for me um i was actually as or more interested in what had been created on stage and in the, the in the the cinematic telling of that story as i was in the story of motown um and, and i'm glad you sort of made that um sort of like that final point in terms of like the sort of cinematic telling because i'd be interested to know yeah. particularly and you feel free to bring in sort of your your work on like um chicago and mm -hmm. to some extent the greatest showman it's kind of like mm -hmm. uh, you seem to have sort of like one foot in the sort of theater world and one foot in the uh, film world in, in some respects and you, you really sort of meld the two uh, in, in your work and so how did you find like the correct how did you know what to take from the theater production and to find that sort of pacing that worked for movies uh, as opposed to kind of sticking you know solely really to the, like the original play right yes which which you can never do i think you know you have to but i'll i'll tell you it was it was a bigger i'd done chicago i'd worked on chicago and there you know i think we Taking the uh, model of cabaret, I think we discovered that paradoxically, when you remain true to these numbers at, as theatrical numbers, it becomes cinematic. So, as you know, in that movie, everything being in Roxy's head takes place on a stage. You know, you, we didn't. There was no way to to apply that idea to Dream Girls because Dream Girls um, has a lot of performance numbers. You know, but mm -hmm. there's also, and I'm telling you, I'm not going. You know, which is a this is somebody just, this is me saying to you right now. So it, it has to permit that convention, which let's face it, in 2006, and we've had, you know, now a decade and a half of these movies and television, and it's a convention that people have now grown up with and, and feel more comfortable with. But it was, it was, it, had, it really felt like an old school convention. I, and I knew we had to do it and wanted to do it. So there are other levels of the musical. Um, there's um, there's actually like a sort of um, Brechtian Greek chorus that plays throughout. It's a, this, there, you know, people okay. sing in the pit, showbiz, it's just showbiz, you know, and I knew that <laughs> is, that is a theater device. Also, there's, it's almost all sung, you know, so that, um, it's a lot of recit. It's just a lot of people screaming and, you know, which remains in the movie, in the 
build up to and I'm telling you in that great number it's all over but I did pull back on a lot of that because there is this thing and, and actually like it, probably three minutes if I had to do it over again I'd probably add two or three minutes of that, that back in the beginning just to get that vocabulary going but I got to say this you know as people watch it today um and there's an even longer version of it available on on uh, blu-ray you know um this is over a hundred minutes of mu of music, you know, and you can't yeah. imagine what a fight that was. It was always a fight. <laughs> why does and I'm telling you have to be six minutes long? And why, you know, mm. and that's what I loved about it. So it's it is it is a quasi opera still, but I think it's been proven, you know, um, that um, you know I, the Avita movie. I love the Avita movie, but for a lot of people, you know, those Android when, when you when you do it is nonstop for over two hours. There's yeah. something that becomes deadening about that in, in a movie theater, you know, it's just too much, you know? So that, Ooh, sorry. Something just came up. I'll get rid of that. Oh, um, the, um, uh, yeah. So it was, that was, that was the big job of adapting it. And also, you know, I'll give you an example. There's a new, we wrote a number of new songs. Henry Krieger wrote a number of new songs, but, um, when you want to show that moment when Effie and, and Curtis are actually in love and getting along on stage, it's a pretty funny, good recit. It's like, Curtis, you know, when I <laughs> like the man's eyes, it's not a full song. And, and in the movie, we wrote Love You, I Do, which isn't, again, one of those moments where she's just singing reality to him. She's singing a song that they've written that expresses how she feels, you know, mm -hmm. which I think is more in the comfort zone of what, where movies live, you know. Mm. And how was it like working with, you know, uh, yeah, uh, Jennifer Hudson, who, who plays at, at, at Fee, Effie, yeah. um, really just off America's Got Talent. And, um, you know, you knew she can sing. I, I don't think that's uh, any doubt. Um, but, you know, it's also a performance in in terms of acting, acting yeah. in this particular style. And how was that? How were your, was your relationship with her and sort of her sort of molding her in this role um, like? Was it was unbelievably close and we remain close and she just started a TV show this week and, you know, we've been in touch. I mean, it's been wonderful to watch, you know, how much she's done and how, and how accomplished she's become. Look, it was a big, big, um, kind of like, um, question mark in the beginning she came in and auditioned three times and the third time we really worked together for a couple of days and it was a full-on costume makeup and acting um audition and she did well um well enough that we could see she had it right mm. but and she we everybody it was it was you know really really hunkering down you know that number, and I'm telling you, was the last thing we did um, because I knew that was, you know, there's no, you could make a wonderful movie. And if, you, if you're not making that moment land, you know, mm. you fail, you know, and that's a number, you know, in mu musicals, you rehearse for a long time, then you uh, pre-record the songs and then some of them you, you do live. But that's something where she pre-recorded the song at the end of the rehearsal period, did it again, and then did it again. Uh, right before we shot, you know, because the growth had been so remarkable. The right. thing about Jennifer is there, are, she is effortlessly, I mean, I, I'm talking about Jennifer then, I'm not talking about the person she's developed into, the actress, mm -hmm. um, but she is effortlessly in touch with her rage. I think she forgets mm -hmm. any kind of self-awareness self and things like that. And that is a lot of where Effie lives, you know, unfortunately, in this story, you know, so she could really, really pull on that, you know, and, and draw from from things. And then she's also just an unbelievably sweet person. So I have to say that one of the things I thought that you had to do in a movie, you know, she's a battle axe that that part is, you know, <laughs> I don't know how many production you see, you seen on stage, but it's just so powerful. But I've seen I've seen actresses who like astonish you without making, without breaking your heart, you know? And I think the breaking your heart part of it is, is crucial. And I, I, and I, I felt 
really confident after we worked together that that's what Jennifer had and could do. And how was it like with, I mean, how was it like working with the cast just as an ensemble? Like you've got so many, yeah. so many big names. Uh, and I, I was watching it the other day. I didn't even realize uh, uh, John Krasinski was even in it. And so, yes, I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so like, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it's so much, um, so much talent. And uh, well, I guess on a musical note, it, it, was there any, not to say pushback, but um, where a lot of the talent are themselves artists and musicians, did yes. they have their own sort of input in, in being like, no, we, we can style it this way or, uh, and how was that sort of, uh, uh, how was, was that middle ground reached? It was great. You know, uh, Jamie Foxx, a great example, right? Um, he has a number of songs. He has this song, When I First Saw You, right? You know, that in every uh, theater production you'll see is, Sung is a more traditional theater love song. When I first saw you, you know, and that's not where Jamie lives at all. And it was mm -hmm. like, no, no, no. Let me, let me, let me, let me. You know, uh, you know. Jennifer had her word was Jenniferize things. You know, he didn't quite, do that, <laughs> cool. but it was basically Jamie, Jamieing it up. And it was just, it was just. He did it. And it was like, oh my god, you've taken this and you found this beautiful essence of it, but mm -hmm. done it in your style. So that happened over and over again, uh, weirdly not with Beyonce, right? Because Beyonce okay. was, she was approaching the, this this as this character, which did, there was an undeniable connection to Diana Ross, you know? Mm -hmm. So she was trying to, never imitating, but trying to, in a real reflection of what the movie's about, uh, pull herself back, you know? Mm. And singing it all for that one new number, listen, you know, where she got to finally find her voice and, and you know, let go. Um, but yeah, I got to say one thing I was very proud of is there, everyone in that movie is a musical performer. You know, there was yeah. nobody who couldn't, couldn't, you know, kill it on a stage, you know. And when you talk about working together and everything... That rehearsal period, by the time we were ready to shoot, we could have gone on stage and done it. In fact, as a oh, wow. as a kind of, um, um, big promotional thing, right before we started shooting, you know, we did step in the we we a lot of press came in and we did step into the bad side. We did a, num oh, a lot nice. of nice <laughs> on stage live, you know, with every cue and the sound and the set <laughs> moving. Those it was so it was oh man, it was very exciting. And uh, I guess my final point was uh, in I think 2017, you had like the the extended sort of Blu-ray version yes, yes. come out, and I guess that would have given you a sort of time to reflect on like how far the films come. And so I guess looking back over the I don't want to get my math wrong, like 16 years or so since the initial yeah. release of the movie, like how how are your thoughts on how it's how it's you know still remained a part of you know popular yeah. film culture popular theater culture uh yeah. and kind of reflecting on the impact of the movie what are your thoughts yeah well i think a lot of things first of all I, you gotta give it to that show because that show was a hit in the west end you know three years mm. ago this this is a major major piece of work but one thing is i'm i'm kind of astonished by how um it, is, it isn't that common to have a 16-year-old movie which is filled with people who are still today huge stars, you know? Yeah. They're, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. like, so if you saw something with that cast now, it'd be like, oh, I want to see that movie, you know? Yeah. And, and um, so I think a lot of it has to do with them. I think it, a lot of it has to do with this incredibly fortunate, fortunate for me, group of people we got together to commit themselves to, to, to make this movie. Wonderful. Um, Bill, uh, thank you very much for your time. I, I know you're like remarkably busy. Um, and it's a pleasure to speak with you. And yeah, no, thank you very much for your time once again. Thank you, Presh. Look forward to it, to seeing it in the movie. I'm going to come over and do it. <laughs> cool, cool. Great.